Um, so we're absolutely thrilled to have with us um, our newest visiting fellow of Murray Edwards College, Dr. Louise Newsom. Please, could we have a round of applause? <laughs> Um, and um, you will all know about Louise because you will have seen the fabulous Davina McCall films and um, read her everywhere and heard her and heard her amazing podcast. And she is a woman who has transformed the lives of many women, including me, so therefore she's particularly important, <laughs> by giving us... Um, the truth about the menopause and I'm very very pleased to say as well that today um, we launched our Murray Edwards College first menopause policy and we're very um, happy anybody who doesn't work with us who would like to see a copy of it um, we're very happy to send it to you and Louise helped us with that so Louise is going to speak, and then we're going to take questions. Normally, I would ask quite a few questions after someone speaks, but I think I'm just guessing that you will all have lots of questions. So I'm going to ask just one or two and then hand it over to you. So Louise, welcome and fire Thank away. Thank you very much. I'm going to come oh, stand that. <clears throat> I actually haven't done anything to deserve an applause. Um, it's a real honour to be here. And actually, just before we walked over here, my 20-year-old phoned me because she'd just been offered a job, which is great. And she said, do you want to tell them all that you didn't get into Cambridge? And I said, no, actually, that was, that was your father, not me. <laughs> but actually, if he had got to Cambridge, I would never have in Freshers' Week many years ago, and we wouldn't have had three children. So there's a reason why he didn't get into Cambridge. But I'm very honoured to be here and to be visiting fellow is, is a real honour. So thank you very much, Dorothy. So I thought I'd title, Why Make a Fuss About the Menopause? It's a huge fuss. There's lots of people really engaging with what I do, but there's also quite a lot of people that are hating what I do. Maybe it's because it's about women taking control of their bodies, I don't really know. So um, I'm just going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes, hopefully pre-answer some of your questions, and then, like Dorothy says, we'll have some questions after. So just for complete transparency, my declarations, I don't, or anyone in my clinic, have any financial disclosures. We don't do any work with any pharmaceutical companies. Most days, actually, now I get asked to be a face or a name behind a menopause shampoo or face cream or magic pillow that's going to help or a magnet to put in your pants, but I'm not <laughs> associated with any of those companies at all, nor will I ever be. Um, I'm quite busy in what I do. I am a mum of three children, but somehow I've managed to do all these things as well. Um, my big declaration in disclosure, really, is that I take HRT. And that's quite important because I think in anything you do, but especially in medicine, you have more empathy and understanding if you've experienced something yourself. And I had no idea what the perimenopause was um, a few years ago. I had no idea how I was going to feel. And then suddenly I turned into this vile monster who hated my husband's breathing, who um, had back-to-back -back migraines, who just was too miserable and tired to do anything. But the worst thing was, or the most ironic thing was, I was actually creating Menopause Doctor website, and I was lecturing to healthcare professionals saying, it's not all about hot flushes. And I was there saying to my husband, I think I've been drugged, it's eight o'clock, I need to go to bed. What's happened to me? Didn't even think about my hormones as a 45-year-old woman that I was then. So we, um, Rebecca, who's sitting at the front, and me set up a clinic in the centre of uh, England, Stratford-upon-Avon, and it's Shakespeare's home um, hometown, but we're trying to convert it into the menopause capital of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it is a very beautiful, it's a very lovely place to, uh, to work. And um, we set up this clinic, we rent the building from the council, um, it's the most beautiful, great to list of building, um, lovely sweeping staircase. It didn't look like this when we took it over. And here we didn't really know what was happening to us. We just thought it would be lovely to have three doctors working with us and try and see a few patients. Um, 
Now we see around 4,000 patients a month through the <coughs> clinic, and we have over 120 clinicians working with us, not all in this building, but we see a lot of patients remotely. And what we wanted to do was try and get over some of the barriers of good menopause care. I started seeing some people on my own, and then I started to engage in social media and the media, and then I started hearing these stories and women coming for miles, telling me that they'd given up their work, their partners had left them, they were really struggling with their mental health and they were only being given antidepressants. And I realised that actually, even me, who's quite ambitious, <coughs> couldn't open a clinic that would help 13 million women in the UK or the 1.2 billion women worldwide. Um, but these are words from the um, all-party parliamentary group on menopause, which I've been part of. And it is an entrenched taboo, and it is a sexism and ageism thing that's been happening for many years. And there are a lot of women who are really not being listened to. And, you know, I have one voice, but I'm happy to use it and abuse it as much as I can so more women get listened to. So when I do any medical presentations, we always start with a case because it homes in what we're doing. So I thought I'd start this presentation talking about Laura, who wasn't called Laura. Um, she didn't look like this, but this is her story. So when I saw her in the clinic, she um, was a 58-year-old lady. And she um, tells me her story for 13 years ago. She was an accountant in a law firm. Good job, well paid, um, major breadwinner for her family. But the last year before, so when she was 44, she started struggling with her job. She found that her sleep was very poor. She often woke in the night. She had very disrupted sleep. She became quite anxious, and she said she had quite negative, intrusive thoughts, especially early hours of the morning. Her mood was very low, which was quite out of keeping for how she was, and her concentration was very difficult as well. Her memory was hard, and as an accountant, she was finding things very difficult, and she just lost all confidence. So she was, went to her doctor to say, I'm really worried about how I'm feeling. These are my symptoms. So the doctor said, well, I think you've got depression, and um, I'm going to give you some antidepressants. So she said, well, I don't think I'm depressed, but that was all that was on offer. So she took antidepressants, but she also took a lot of time off work. She had lots of sick notes that were, had depression written on them. Um, and she found that very difficult, and she just thought, well, there's no way I'm going to go on the career ladder. I'm not going to be able to be promoted. Um, and then she uh, left her job because she just couldn't carry on with it. She, her mental clarity was not, not good enough. Um, so then she went to work as a receptionist in a veterinary, um, a local veterinary practice. Um, and she was on the screen a lot, checking people in. Her migraines were becoming a lot worse. And she couldn't remember her password at work, which she found incredibly embarrassing because a lot of the people she worked with were younger than her. She, every morning she went on, and then she was so short-tempered, she'd just be going mad with the computer. And she just realised that it wasn't really a job that she could do. She was worried that she had dementia because her short-term memory was being really affected. She was finding it difficult to remember words, and her grandmother had really bad dementia, so she was understandably worried about that. She was constantly tired, just couldn't have any energy at all, and no self-motivation or drive to do anything. Um, she also had quite a lot of urinary symptoms, some urinary tract infections, which had a lot of urgency and frequency. And when she was sitting behind the reception area, just to go off to the toilet all the time was becoming very embarrassing. So she went to a doctor again, and she was given painkillers. She was given strong medication for her migraines. And quite often, if people have got bad migraines, we give um, medication which is actually anti-epileptic drugs to try and stop the frequency of migraines. But they often cause side effects. So she was given quite heavy-duty drugs, and she was given quite a lot of antibiotics for her urinary tract infections. She then got some palpitations, which she found very scary um, because her uh, mother and her, her uncle had, had, family, uh, she had a family history of heart disease. Her stamina was still very low. She went then to the hospital. The doctor said, I don't know what else is wrong with you. Now you've got these palpitations, you've got memory loss, you've got um, other um, symptoms, you've got joint pains. Let's go to the hospital. So she went numerous times and she had to miss loads of appointments. To go to the appointment, she had to miss lots of time from work. So she had a brain scan, she had a heart tests, she had x rays, she had bladder scans. And um, she was told all her tests were normal which is great for the doctor to say that, but for her, she wasn't feeling normal. But then she was eventually diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. 
She then left her reception job because she couldn't carry on working and worked as a cleaner because um, she thought, I need to get some cash, I need to get some money in for the family. Um, but then her muscle and joint pains got a lot worse, the painkillers weren't helping, she was constantly tired. So she um, stopped working after three months and then had no job at all. She spent 10 years unemployed, feeling like a complete failure, still having symptoms and then became um, quite argumentative, very irritable with her husband and family. Some of it was frustration, but some of it she just felt that her brain was just telling her to be cross and it was allowing her to be like that. She had really zero libido, which didn't um, help her relationship with her partner. So any intimacy just went. She kept going to bed early, pretending she had a headache, trying to avoid her husband, not wanting even to hold his hand in case it developed into something else. Um, sex, when she did have it, was incredibly painful. Um, she wasn't ex had never experienced pain before, but she didn't know what was causing that. Um, so after 25 years of a happy marriage, she left her husband and had very little contact with her two children because she'd really distanced herself from, from them. So she again saw many healthcare professionals over the years and started to think, could it be anything to do with my hormones? But she was told, look, there's nothing wrong with your hormones because you're still having periods and anyway, you're not having hot flushes. Um, so it's quite doom and gloom. I, I hope you weren't coming for a nice evening. <laughs> um, so then actually her mother then thought, obviously, we're always worried about our children and she was worried about her daughter. And she just so happened, this isn't bigging myself up, this is a true story, she heard me on this morning and said, I wonder whether it is a menopause. I think you should go back and see someone else and really, you know, crack on and think, could it be a menopause or perimenopause because she was still having periods. Um, so it's very obvious. Of course it's going to be menopause because I'm here to talk about the menopause. I'm not here to talk about anything else. It's all I think about. But actually, all these symptoms are really common menopausal symptoms. And, you know, Rebecca and I, until we opened the clinic, we didn't really think about it. No one taught us at medical school about the menopause. No one taught me when I was doing cardiology jobs or rheumatology jobs or um, neurology jobs. We just didn't do it. And then um, we, we still, the training is not good enough. So women often go from pillar to post without being told or being listened to. And it's the being listened to, I think, is really sad. So let's think about what is the diagnosis of the menopause. We hear it all the time. And wrongly or rightly, I've worked quite hard to get it into the media. Um, but a lot of people are like, oh, not the menopause again. Well, let's break down the word meno is menstrual cycle periods, pause is obviously stop. Um, it doesn't mean men, pause, go away, I don't want anything to do with you. Um, and it's a really weird diagnosis because actually to make the diagnosis you have to have stopped your periods for a whole year. So if you're 11 and a half months and then your period comes, that's it, you can't be menopausal. Absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? We're defined by our menstruation, whereas a lot of women might have a hysterectomy or they might have a marina coil or not have periods. So then how do they define their menopause? Well, um, it's impossible actually. There's no blood test, it's not easy to diagnose. We know that the average age of the menopause in the UK is 51. Many countries, it's a lot younger. Um, but one in 100 women under the age of 40 have an early menopause. One in 1,000 under the age of 30. M the youngest patient I've ever seen is 14 when she was menopausal. She had one natural period and her ovaries hadn't developed properly. Um, so we see a lot of young women we also know the perimenopause is when hormones start changing, our eggs um, deplete, our hormones associated reduce. So when our hormones start to go, we can start to get menopausal symptoms despite having periods. So most women in their 40s will be perimenopausal, but a lot of women in their 30s and even in their 20s might be as well. But it's all very well thinking about periods or fertility, but what about our hormones? What are they? They're just biologically active chemicals, if you like, in our body that go all around our body to every area of our brain. So we do need to think about it as a hormone deficiency because that's what happens. Our ovaries stop producing the hormones, so we don't have them anymore. It wasn't such an issue in the Victorian times and we used to die a couple of years after our menopause, but now, thankfully, we're living for decades after. Um, we need to think about what these hormones do to our bodies, not just to our wombs, not just for our fertility, but to our brains, to our bones, to our heart, and so forth. 
So menopause means different things to different people. And a few years ago, I even had, I can't believe I even did it, I was doing some work with West Midlands Police. And um, we, we went into Birmingham city centre with a, a placard saying, what is the menopause? And we, we filmed different people coming and talking about it. And this was before it was in the paper every day. And some of the things that people said were actually the same as what often people think um, now when, when people have been asked. And it really depends on different cultures as well. A lot of people think it's an older woman's problem, it's a middle-aged, it's, you know, it's... And even me at 45, seven years ago, I was thinking, oh, gosh, no, I'm, I'm not old enough to be menopausal or perimenopausal. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's not. Or it's this sort of shame, it's this dirty secret. You know, when my, when my mum was young, the periods were called the curse. There's something quite awful, isn't there, about being a woman who menstruates or has problems. So it's something that we should be ashamed of, especially if it's linked with reduced fertility as well. A lot of people don't even talk about it. Some countries, they, they don't, some languages, they don't even have a word for menopause. And, and certain cultures, it's, it's, a, it's a real taboo to be able to talk about it. For some women, it's very liberating, though. To not have periods means they can pray, they can go to church more. Um, but for other people, it's their identity as a woman because it means they're potentially fertile. Very unseen, lots of women are hidden away from society when they're menopausal, partly because of their symptoms, because they're not working, um, and they're not seen as a use anymore. Um, we've just, I was just saying to... Um, uh, Dorothy, that we've just funded um, as a surgeon to complete her training in Uganda. And a lot of women, if they've got urinary symptoms, urinary incontinence can be very common, these women can't, do, can't pray, they can't go to church, they're ostracised from their communities. So you can see why these poor, you know, poor menopausal women are just, let's, let's forget about them, let's move on to other generations, which is so wrong. And then, because it is, for most of us, it's a natural process. For some women, it's not. Um, I had a 19-year-old woman um, who came to see me who'd had a cancer of her thigh and had chemotherapy and radiotherapy had stopped her ovaries working. Other women have it, their ovaries removed in operations. So it's not always natural, but for most women, it's natural. So then they think, well, it's just natural in the same way that periods are natural, so let's just endure it, let's just see. Um, and then some people think it's just a transition, like we metamorphosize into something amazing when our symptoms go. But um, I spoke to a lady yesterday who'd had a hysterectomy age 32, she's now 73. She's had hot flushes and sweats every single day. Um, so the symptoms don't always go, they might change with time. But if you Google the menopause, this is what comes up, and <laughs> I don't think that I look like any of these people, and I am a menopausal woman. Um, through balance, these are real menopausal women from different cultures, and they're all gorgeous women. I'm not saying that I'm a gorgeous woman, but these are all lovely women who are happy. But they're menopausal women. You know, we don't wear badges to say, I am menopausal. We're allowed to look in different ways. Um, but, you know, we, we, this is really hard to try and get information when you Google and look at this. And then even every conference I go to for doctors and nurses and clinicians, it's all about vasomotor symptoms, flushes and sweats, which we know affect around 70% of women, or vaginal dryness, and maybe that's because men are thinking about sex, I don't know. <laughs> but actually there are lots of other symptoms, and through balance, these are the top 20 symptoms. And I've just done a questionnaire, which is going to be released soon, the results for my book that's come out, and it echoes these results. Number one is brain fog. It's not about the hot flushes, which, you know, a bit lower down, night sweats are lower down. So give us a fan and a new uniform at work is not going to cut it. It's not going to help the brain fog, the anxiety, the low libido, the memory problems, the low mood, the joint pains. And this is why it's really hard sometimes for doctors to diagnose because, you know, these symptoms often aren't at there together at the same time. They might come and go. Not everybody's experience is the same. And so it's very difficult sometimes for us to know, you know, am I irritable because I can't stand my husband? Or am I irritable because my brain's not working properly, making me think I can't stand my husband? And, you know, it, it's difficult. And it often comes at a stage where we're torn in different directions. You know, we might not be sleeping because we're worried about something or because our husbands are snoring next to us or our partner's driving us mad. It might be something completely different. But when all these symptoms occur together, we need to think about our hormones. This is not a scientific picture, this is just a, a, a very basic drawing of what happens when we're children. We don't have hormones in our body, that's fine. And then they start to go very chaotic, and I've 
three daughters, and my children were not quite as smoothly chaotic. They were a lot more up and down in their teens. And then they come into a rhythm, the estrogen and progesterone, with, when people have regular periods, this is quite normal. And then often the progesterone starts to drop, and then the estrogen is all over the place. So it can be very high, actually, as well as very low. And it's this area in the perimenopause that often people get worsening symptoms. And then it flatlines. And this is where the menopause, I hate to tell you, lasts forever, because the low hormones don't suddenly regenerate. They don't suddenly, you can't eat enough soy, or you can't use that menopause face cream, and it's going to help your hormones. It, they become low, and they stay low forever. And thinking about our hormones, thinking about the symptoms, every cell in our body responds to estrogen and testosterone. Um, and this is a, a picture that I nick from Dan Reisel, who's our clinical research lead, um, who's here today. But this is looking at our estrogen and testosterone receptors in our brain. Now, you don't have to be a clever neuroscientist to realize that actually our brains are really important. Areas that look at reward, look at happiness, look at mood, look at emotions. Um, they're all there. Cerebellum looks at our coordination. A lot of people find their coordination um, goes when they're menopausal. Because our brain is deprived of a really important neurotransmitter. And these hormones work with other hormones in our body. So hormones such as serotonin, dopamine, um, even our stress hormones like cortisol, our thyroxine, our thyroid hormone, all these hormones work together. Our bodies are very, very clever, but they're not so clever if we don't have our hormones working properly. So just to make this talk even more gloomy, it's not just about symptoms, actually. I'm a physician, I'm not a gynaecologist, so I'm very interested in preventing disease. I don't actually want people to see me. What we need to do to try and enable the NHS to keep working is to reduce our risk of diseases rather than treat diseases. But without our hormones, there's an increased risk of diseases. And they're all inflammatory diseases that occur because estrogen helps our immune system to work really well. Without estrogen, we have an increased bone turnover. So we lose bone. And this is um, obviously a knee. Um, this is if you cut it across, you'll see this honeycomb appearance. But if you don't have the right uh, balance of the, the cells that build bone and break bone down, you get these big holes, a bit like an aero bar. And you can imagine falling on that, you're more likely to break. So there's an increased risk of osteoporosis. We know around one in um, two women over the age of 50 who don't take HRT will develop osteoporosis. And one in three will have an osteoporotic hip fracture, which costs the NHS about three billion pounds a year. So it's not an insignificant cost. We also know that the risk of a heart attack increases by a factor of around five after the menopause because oestrogen protects the lining of the blood vessels, helps reduce um, atheroma and reduce the risk of a heart attack. We also know that women who have a heart attack are less likely to have typical symptoms, it takes longer for a diagnosis and actually their prognosis is worse. There's lots of metabolic changes that occur in the body as well. Oestrogen is very important for our um, metabolism as well. Um, so there's an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And just when you're feeling really bad about yourself, there's an increased risk of putting on weight. And there's reasons for this. Of course, some people tell me in the clinic, and I was the same, you feel rubbish. So you're not going to be getting up and cooking in the same way. You're sleeping worse. We know poor sleep helps make um, people can help or not help, but can increase weight. But also, some people are drinking more alcohol. They're not exercising in the same way. But even if your lifestyle is exactly the same, what happens is our body wants estrogen. It's designed to have estrogen. If it can't get it from our ovaries, it can get it from fat cells. It's a very weak type of estrogen. It's not a very nice type of estrogen. It's called estrone. But that's what it has, it, and it's usually the midline. So just when you look down and you think, great, what's happening now? Um, and it can be very common because our body wants to try and get that estrogen back. I'm very interested in the brain. We're trying to do a lot more research in this area, but there is this cognitive decline, and we know from lots of studies over decades that women who have um, an earlier menopause have a lot higher risk of dementia. What no one has really done is join the dots and say, well, what happens when we put those hormones back? We know there's an increased risk of clinical depression. We know that suicide increases by a factor of seven in women in the late 40s. And um, we see time and time again, actually, most days in the clinic, we hear from women who have suicidal thoughts. And we know it's not a mental health disorder because they've already been given 
numerous antidepressants. Sometimes they've had electric convulsive therapy. Recently, we've seen a few people who've been given ketamine, which seems to be a new treatment that the psychiatrists give to women, um, and they improve with HRT. We also know that COVID, actually, um, and any infection can get worse when you don't have hormones because estrogen is so important at regulating our immune cells. So how do we make a diagnosis? It's all very well having this doom and gloom information, but what do we do? Well, we can't have a blood test or a saliva test or a urine test or whatever some of the companies are trying to sell us, actually. What we need to do is empower ourselves um, and or empower ourselves for our own diagnosis or for others that we know. I've spent a lot of time over the last seven years or so developing resources on the Balance Menopause website. I do a weekly podcast. We're constantly updating and adding information which is more bespoke to people. We've got the free Balance Menopause app um, where people can have information and try and track and monitor their symptoms. And you can download a health report um, where people can actually take this health report to their doctor, which is, for me, as a GP in 10 minutes, it's a lot more useful looking at this than having to say, what's your mood like? What's your sleep like? Do you have any muscle pains? Do you have any joint pains? Because you can take the whole 10 minutes just asking questions. This way, we can go and say, I think I'm perimenopausal. These are my symptoms. This is my periods. I'd now like to talk to you about treatment that's relevant to me. I've also written a couple of books that you might know, and this morning I have just signed 1,200 copies of <laughs> this book that's coming out in two weeks' time. And it's quite a chunky book, actually. Um, it feels a bit surreal seeing so many in a warehouse that I went to today. Um, and it's more like a definitive guide, so obviously I feel that every household should have one. But, um, but I've referenced a lot through it. It's, it's talking a lot about... Um, what the menopause is, but all different treatments. It's not just about hormones, it's about lifestyle, well-being, and I've got a lot of um, people have shared their experience, but also a lot of experts talking as well through it. So it's not just me throughout the whole book. So how do we manage it? Do we just have to go home and feel awful and um, wait for nothing to improve? Well, there are ways of managing it, actually. The most important thing is knowing about it, knowing that you haven't got dementia, knowing that you haven't got arthritis, knowing that there's a reason why you've put on weight or there's a reason that sex is so painful. You know, power is really important. Knowledge is so important so we can be empowered. So education, not just for women, actually. Everybody knows a woman. Therefore, everybody is going to know a perimenopausal and menopausal woman. Um, so that's really important, but also healthcare professionals absolutely need to know because when someone comes we can't just look there and say why don't you buy a relaxation tape or it will you'll, it will pass which is what sometimes happens it shouldn't be a taboo you know my i've got three children and they seem to be able to talk about all sorts of things you know um in a way that i would never have spoken to my mother about menopause is just something that you know we all should be talking about it shouldn't be embarrassing um, so there shouldn't be any stigma around it. But we should understand what it is. And then, once you have understanding, you can decide how to help yourself or how to help others and educate them. And we should be talking about the hormones. There's a lot of backlash about hormones, but actually what we need to do, rather than thinking about the risks of HRT, which is what we've been told for the last 20 years, we need to think about the risks of not taking HRT, actually. Um, Obviously, there's no point me taking HRT and having whiskey on my cereal every morning and smoking 30 cigarettes a day and not exercising. So it's really important. But actually, when I was perimenopausal, talk to me about any of this, I probably would have lamped you on. <laughs> so, um, it's, you know, it's, it's important to do everything as well. Um, and, you know, it's very transformational, the work I do as a doctor in my menopause clinic because women do come back and they more motivated, they're more likely to exercise. And it's the most amazing tool in medicine to be able to help people feel better, but also help them invest in their future health. So there are lots of treatments. I, this is just a few that I Googled, and every day there's more and more. And uh, we were working out the cost, actually, of some of these creams. This one is more expensive than champagne. Um, so, you know, and actually one of the 
dermatologists we work with looked at it and it, some of the ingredients, they're no better than just using a really basic moisturiser. So you just have to be really careful what you're spending money on. All these supplements, anything with meno or um, mm. uh, menopause on are, are often just a marketing thing. There's no reason to get them at all. There's no evidence behind them. So HRT, the three-letter word, there's lots of different types, there's lots of different doses. It's not just a one-dose fits all. We're very fortunate that we can bespoke it in a lot better way. And most HRT, well, all HRT is available on the, NH, on the NHS. Some types of testosterone aren't, um, but men obviously are allowed testosterone, so we can just prescribe the men testosterone in lower doses through the NHS. So there's different preparations. All women usually need oestrogen. If they've got a womb, they need, use progesterone. And testosterone is another hormone that's actually we produce more of than oestrogen, but it's just a lot harder to get hold of. But um, we are allowed to prescribe it if women have reduced libido despite taking HRT. But we notice in our clinical experience that mood, energy, concentration, stamina often improve as well. Usually we give oestrogen through the skin as patches or gels because there's no risk of clot or stroke that way and you can change the dose. So we're just using the skin as a vehicle to get it into the bloodstream. Um, there are pills, the progesterone is a, is a capsule um, and there is a spray but it doesn't often get very absorbed very well. You'll be pleased to know it's not made from pregnant horses' urine anymore. It's actually um, made from wild yam plants and it's body identical, which means it's exactly the same when you look down the microscope um, as the hormones that we produce when we're younger. It's um, metabolically and biologically quite different to synthetic hormones. So in the WHI, the Women's Health Initiative study that we've all heard about causing all these risks, they use these synthetic hormones and horses' urine um, HRT, so very different to what we prescribe now. So Despite everyone thinking that HRT is a devil, there are benefits of taking HRT. And firstly, we're treating the underlying cause. So if your symptoms have been caused by low hormones, it makes sense you give the hormones back and symptoms improve. Um, sometimes you have to change the dose and type of HRT to optimise symptoms. Um, but it's very hard to know in the clinic, are your symptoms related or not? And we often say to women, look, we'll optimise your hormones and then see what's left. Um, but we know from guidance, even the NICE guidance that came out seven years ago, say the majority of women, the benefits outweigh the risks. But also, it reduces the risk of all these diseases that I've been talking about. And that's really important, actually, when you think about sort of global health. Most women die from heart disease and dementia, and we know that taking HRT reduces risk of these diseases. But only around 14% of women in the UK take HRT. That's not the majority, in my mind. In areas of deprivation, it's as low as 2%. So women are missing out. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot more talk about dementia. Um, we're trying to do some research with some of this team because there, are, there is evidence. If you use the proper body identical hormones, we can reduce the risk of dementia, which is really important. So you might say, well, why aren't people taking it? If it's so wonderful, why aren't people taking it? Well, we're all scared, aren't we? Because we've been scared away from it for the last 20 years. And healthcare professionals are also worried. So even if you're empowered as a woman, I, can't, I physically cannot get HRT from my GP. My GP refuses to prescribe it. And I'm a white, middle-class, educated menopause specialist. So how do other people get it? And this, uh, these articles came out um, in the papers about six months after I started taking HRT. And I thought, oh no, this is it. I'm going to have to take off my patches and divorce my husband. This is going to be really hard. Um, but actually, I went back and I, I'm fine. I've got a scientific brain. I went and read the papers and actually the risk was very small. When you've got a triple small risk, it's still a small risk. But everyone worries about breast cancer. It affects one in seven women. When I was a medical student in the 80s, it was one in 12 women. And then when I was an, a postgraduate, it was one in 11. And it's become a lot more common. But actually, HRT prescribing has fallen off a cliff. So even common sense would tell you it can't all be related to HRT. We know one of the commonest reasons um, for all cancers, actually one of the biggest risks is obesity. And we know that um, there's other reasons why people get breast cancer. Often it's just bad luck. It can run in families. It can be more common the older we get, so the less hormones we have in our body. But the last three are modifiable risk factors, so obesity, alcohol, reduced exercise. A lot of women will say, 
they put on weight, they drink more alcohol, they're not exercising, but they won't take HRT, yet they're increasing their risk of breast cancer and they're avoiding HRT because they're worried about breast cancer. So we have to think about other reasons of getting breast cancer. But then about, you know, what about this risk with HRT? Well, it's actually quite reassuring. We know that if women are young, all we're doing is replacing the missing hormones. If they're under the age of 51, there's no risk of breast cancer in any type of HRT. We know that with body identical hormones that we prescribe, there's never been a study to prove there's an increased risk of breast cancer. And we know, even from the WHI scary study that came out, women who'd had a hysterectomy who only had oestrogen actually have a lower risk of breast cancer. And we know that any type of HRT is associated with a lower risk of dying from breast cancer. So women who do get breast cancer actually had a better prognosis. The, the only risk seems to be with these older progestogens, the synthetic progestogens that aren't body identical, but the study showed it wasn't even statistically significant, so the risk is very, very low. So we need to think about the bigger picture of the benefits and also other risk factors. Drinking a couple of units of wine most nights will increase your risk of breast cancer, I hate to tell you, more than taking the worst type of HRT, yet we don't crack open a bottle of wine and it has this big warning about breast cancer all over it. So we do need to think about other risk factors for breast cancer, it's not all about HRT. So finally, just to mention a bit about work, menopause at work is a real, real <coughs> issue. This is a study we did a couple of years ago now, but it's very similar. This is really staggering. You know, women, one in uh, five women almost are taking more than eight weeks off work. Women are resigning, taking early retirement. A lot of people aren't having any support, unlike in this college, of course. But people aren't going for promotion. They're reducing their hours. And around one in 10 um, women are resigning. 40% of the NHS workforce are menopausal women. If you say 10% are resigning, <coughs> and a lot of people are not going for promotion, it's, we're hemorrhaging people left, right and centre. So we need to help women, but we don't need to help them just by giving them a different uniform and a fan. We need to be helping them and signposting them so they get the treatment that they deserve. We've done quite a few of awareness posters through Balance to make people think a bit more than hot flushes as well. <coughs> So just to the end of the presentation, for a happy ending, you'll be pleased to know, um, I did see Laura in the clinic and um, gave her HRT, exactly the same HRT that I would have given if she was my NHS GP patient. And um, she came back three months later. Don't forget, she'd l suffered for more than 10 years, and I did think it would take a lot longer to get her to feel better. But she came back and said, most of my symptoms have completely improved. I'm enjoying my life again and feel happy. I no longer have joint pains and I can sleep all night. I have not felt this good for many years. I have now stopped taking so many of my other medications. I'm enjoying life again, thank you. And it's very rewarding, but actually it shouldn't be rewarding. It should be something that's just happening. So finally, hopefully you realise that it's more than just symptoms are low hormones. And we need to be empowered with evidence-based information. There's a lot of hocus-pocus rubbish out there for us to look at. Um, we can't eat yam plants. We can't um, take supplements that are going to replace our missing hormones. HRT provides more benefits than risks for the majority of women. And as women who are menopausal or perimenopausal, we should all receive individualised advice. There's a Balance website and the free Balance app, which you can get information. Education is really important. So this is just a lady saying that the app had given her confidence to seek help. Really lovely. I love hearing stories like this. And the Balance app is free. The free part is always going to be free to really help women. So I hope that's been useful, and I hope it hasn't been too depressing, but thank you very much for listening. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, Louise, and um, I wasn't quite as bad as that woman, but I did have 10 years of not being able to sleep, and in my case, it was six weeks after I started to take HRT that I just slept completely normally again, and I say to everybody, I, I couldn't literally have become president of this college without taking HRT, because I would just be asleep all the time. 
um, which does sometimes happen at university events, I have to admit. <laughs> Uh, now, I want to open it up to people, but first I wanted to ask you about a, a very important group of women, and that is women who have had breast cancer or uterine cancer, and traditionally women who have had breast cancer, say, have been told, well, there's absolutely no chance at all that you can take HRT, even perhaps if a woman had breast cancer 20 years mm -hmm. before. Now, I know that it's different for every woman, yeah. but I wonder if you could say a bit about um, whether it's ruled out and what the advantages might particularly be for a woman with breast cancer if, for example, because of the drug she's taken, yeah. she has serious osteoporotic symptoms? Yeah, that's a really good question because I've already said one in seven women get breast cancer. So that's a huge number of women who have often been told they can never have hormones. Well, you should never drive on the motorway at 71 miles an hour, and I'm sure most people have. So I think the first thing with medicine, anything in medicine, is you can never say never because everyone's different. Um, we've been doing a lot of work looking at all the evidence, and like most things in menopause and most things in women's health has been very, very little or very poor research in this area. So a lot of it is going by a sort of gut feeling. And what the, the big confusion is, is that it, when people have breast cancer, they look, they look down the microscope and have they got oestrogen receptors on, yes or no? Now, actually, if they're oestrogen receptor negative, it means that they've got a more aggressive cancer because it's abnormal to have no oestrogen receptors because I've already said oestrogen receptors are on every cell in the body. So actually, if they don't have oestrogen receptors, most oncologists think, well, HRT is fine with that because it's not going to stimulate anything. But having an oestrogen receptor in a cancer doesn't mean it's been caused by oestrogen. It just means that you've got a cancer. You know, if I chopped off the end of my finger, there'd be oestrogen receptors all over it. So um, what we don't know is that whether we give back oestrogen, it's going to make anything worse or better even. Um, a lot of the treatments block oestrogen, and we know that if you have some of the oestrogen blocking tr treatments, it will reduce ri risk of recurrence, sometimes mortality, but the figures are really quite small, actually, and this is where individualization is really important. We know that, actually, oestrogen used to be a treatment for breast cancer before tamoxifen occurred, because it's so anti-inflammatory, there's, there's even pictures from the 70s with people with very horrible fungating cancers that just completely go with oestrogen. So it's not as easy as saying you can or you can't because we don't know. Some studies have shown that women do better when they've had HRT. One study so showed that women did slightly worse, as in they had an increased risk of recurrence, not death, but that was using older types of HRT. So it's like comparing apples with pears. So then we're in this box of, actually, we really don't know. Um, it all depends on when the cancer was, what stage it was, what size it was, but also the most important thing is what's that woman suffering? You know, we see a lot of women in the clinic who say, I'm just existing, I'm not living, I want to die standing up, not lying down. We had a lady recently who um, was suicidal and her whole family were what so worried about. She'd given up her job, she'd become housebound, she'd been on HRT before, had then had a diagnosis and was told she could never have hormones and she became a shell of a person. She came down to see us, she had some HRT because I was really worried about her mental state. Three months later I get this email to say, I'm camping outside, I'm having the best life ever. My life expectancy might be less but you know what, I'm loving every single minute. And this is where I think it's about empowerment and it's about choice. We've been working with a steering group of people, so oncologists, radiotherapists, um, patients as well as, 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 as a menopause specialist going through all the evidence and we've written some consensus statements based on the evidence that will come out in the next couple of months or so which will be really helpful but again we have to think most women who've had breast cancer die from heart disease and dementia a lot of women we see are more worried about osteoporosis or dementia than they are about recurrence of their breast cancer. I've seen women who've said to me, I would prefer to lose my other breast, have, on, have chemotherapy and radiotherapy again, if it meant I could sleep through the night, if it meant that I could have sex with my husband, if it meant that I, you know, it's, it's, and that's, that's not for me mm. to say, yes, you can or no, you can't. I think 
We need to be advocates for women um, and our patients and share the uncertainty. You know, they could get run over by a bus next week. And so me stopping them to have HRT actually might not change their future. We just don't know. And so I feel very sad when women are just told, no, that's it. You know? And uh, women who I know who have had breast cancer say that if they go to the oncologist, what the oncologist is obsessed with is, I just don't want you to have cancer, yes. and therefore um, don't take it. Mm. And they, they don't see the woman, they see the cancer. Yeah. And I don't know if that's something that you've it come is, across. And, and when, so some of the treatments, so the aromatase inhibitors, as you know, they sort of wring out any bit of oestrogen from the body. And a lot of people have a lot of symptoms, and we know it increases risk of osteoporosis, probably increases risk of heart disease and dementia because you haven't got hormones. But when they've looked at the studies, they're looking all about recurrence of breast cancer or death from breast cancer. They're not looking at the other side of things. So we don't know, and this is what's so frustrating. Um, there is a, a tool called the PREDICT tool that you can go online and look what your risk of death is most likely to be. And in the early stages, it's more likely related to breast cancer. With time, you're more likely to die from other causes such mm. as heart disease. So that can be quite useful. Um, but a lot of women, we say, well, you could try HRT for three months, see how you feel, and then you can make that decision yourself. Um, a lot of women we've seen have had breast cancer many years ago, then their periods have come back, no one minded. Then they went through the menopause, and everyone's saying, no, no, you can't have hormones. Well, they've had hormones the last five, 10 years with their own cycle. So it, some of it just doesn't quite make sense. Um, oncologists are scared because they see it as a failure if the woman then has a recurrence. But the woman might say, well, I prefer to accept that risk because I would like my job back or mm. I would like something. And HRT is fully reversible, as you know. If we both stopped our HRT today, it would be out of our system by tomorrow. So, you know, it, it's not like giving an injection that's going to last for years. So mm. the other thing is we've got the shared decision-making guidance from NICE, which came out uh, 18 months ago now. And that's really important when we're looking at any area of medicine. It's not about my personal decision. It's about the patient and sharing the uncertainty, sharing risks with benefits, and having an informed, consenting consultation. And this is where any areas of uncertainty in medicine are really important. So much in medicine we don't know. I don't know the long-term risks of giving a statin to, to someone. No one's done it in women. Or, you know, some of these new dementia drugs. We don't know really what their risks or benefits are. So, again, women are not stupid. We can actually be involved in decision-making. And we can change our minds. You know, what we might want or not want now might be different in five or ten years' time as well. Mm. No, I am very keen to take any questions. So while we're talking, if you have a question, yes? Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just uh, have a question for example, the people who get endometriosis, do you have a special treatment for them? Because if I mean, the, it plays on the hormones and the, you know, endometriosis is uh, very affected by the level of hormones as well. So if you take, um, uh, can, can you, can the HRT, yeah, so en endometriosis, as you probably know, is where there's um, cells that are the same as the lining of the womb elsewhere. Um, and because our lining of our womb responds to hormones, um, in a normal cycle, our hormones are changing, as you know, and the lining of the womb then changes as well. So if people have endometriosis, they can get flare-ups at different times of their cycle. If you give HRT, what we normally do is give the same dose of estrogen and progesterone throughout, so then you don't get flare-up of endometriosis, and it can be very beneficial. Um, some women have had surgery for endometriosis, so then have a hysterectomy. We normally, um, if they've got any endometriosis tissue left, we still give progesterone, which we wouldn't always do when someone's had um, a, a hysterectomy. But, but yeah, it often can people feel actually a lot better when they've got some, even if it's low dose all the time, if they've got endometriosis. Thank you. Yes. I think a 
awareness is the most important thing, actually, because menopause has always been a bit of a butt of a joke, isn't it? It's like, oh, just she's menopausal, let's just... And actually, for that women, I know even when I was working, I was really vulnerable because I couldn't remember names of drugs. I couldn't actually... When the patients were going on telling me things, I couldn't even remember where they started or what the symptoms were. I was really worried I was going to lose my job. I was only working one day a week as a GP because I've been a medical writer as well. I thought, I can't go more part-time because I'm going to have to give up. And it's really quite scary. What I would have loved is someone to go... Louise, have you read this leaflet? Because she's 45, or, you know, have you thought maybe? And it would have just been that light bulb moment. And there are ways, I think, you know, we often see more of the people we work with than we do our family, if we've got long hours. So actually, people do know, and there are ways of doing it. And I've spoken to a lot of people who, actually, male colleagues have, have picked it up on female. Then you can do it in the right way. And I think it's really important. There's been a lot of discussion about in workplaces having more responsibility and they always need to look after these menopausal women and reduce their hours and flexible working and actually if you reduce your hours you reduce your pay which isn't great you reduce your pension everything else as well so i sort of think um if i had a broken arm and it was looking quite sore i'd really hope someone at work would say god louise that looks sore i'll drive you to the nearest hospital get it plastered take a bit of time off work then come back when you're ready and carry on with your job and it's a bit like that with the menopause. You know, we want to know, well, how do you get help? Not everyone can feel completely amazing or back to normal on HRT or might not take HRT. But let's look at other ways we can help. Let's try and support. But actually, let's try and get you the best that you are. So selfishly, as an employer, I employ about 250 people. Quite a few of these are menopausal women. I want them to work well because I don't want them to go off sick. I want them to be working hard. So there's a bit of investment that employers should do um, to sort of realise. But it's very hard. I mean, I'm on the government task force and the first meeting they were talking about flexible hours and fans and uniforms. And I think people think it's just this transition that we'll just have for a few years and we can sort of pat our head, their heads and then they'll suddenly be fine again. And it's not like that. So it's education, I think, is really key. Uh, well, I would say because I um, was part of introducing the menopause policy at Channel 4, which was the first menopause policy of any um, British broadcaster, uh, that the first thing is that as an employer, it said that we cared about women. Um, it, we made all managers... Um, be trained and uh, a key issue can be that older women who think who say well I had no menopause problem would say well I had no menopause problem and I used to say well if um, if I've got a broken arm and it's in plaster you wouldn't say to me well I don't have a broken arm in plaster I mean it's a completely irrelevant uh, point and, but actually, a number of those women who said, well, I didn't have any symptom, realized that actually um, they had an increased risk of osteoporosis and it made them think about their own health. But I would say the thing that was most useful was that we brought in uh, two doctors and they talked about the facts of HRT. They talked about the risks, the, um, the benefits. They went through it all. And what happened then was that women talked to each other mm. about, well, my GP gave me HRT. And then the other woman would say, well, my GP refuses to give me HRT. And then we'd say, well, why don't you move your... GP or go and tell your GP what to do because as we showed in the film that we made with Davina McCall actually GPs were just as ignorant as the general population really. I mean um, several said that they'd had 30 minutes training in their medical training about the menopause which is bizarre because it was going to affect half the, the women and lots of GPs were just saying, it's natural, you have to put up with it. Um, if you take HRT, it will give you cancer. And 
they were saying things which were untrue. So women went to their GPs and challenged them, and they moved their GPs. Um, but also, uh, Channel 4 pressurized the, um, their private health provider to provide menopause support on Channel 4's policy, which they had previously done. Channel 4 said, if you don't provide it, um, then we will leave and go to another provider. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that it was actually for us the medical information that we got, and then we all empowered each other um, to go and challenge our doctors. Yes. You think that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I, with the National Menopause Programme that the NHS is doing, a few years ago, um, it was actually just before COVID, I got hold of somebody and said, who works in NHS, is quite high up. I said, look, this is awful. The stories I'm hearing can't keep going on. Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, but we don't really believe women in the same way. I said, well, OK, we'll look at the finance. So actually, this case that I presented, what we did is we went through all her notes and we looked at the money that was spent on all her medication, all her appointments, because going to a hospital is a lot more expensive than going to a GP. So we put everything into this massive spreadsheet and then we worked out that if 1% of menopausal women were like her, and there's a lot more than 1%, it would save the economy half a billion pounds a year. So then they went, oh, right, Louise, well, maybe we ought to do something here. Yeah, great. So they've set up this menopause programme, but what they've sadly done is recruited a lot of people who really hate HRT. So the last meeting I was at, I actually switched off my camera and muted myself like I was some teenager <laughs> doing homeschooling. And... Um, they would just say, look, the pendulum's now gone the other way. These doctors are over-prescribing HRT. We need to rein them back in. This media attention has been very detrimental. Da -da -da -da. Women now thinking that all their symptoms are due to their hormones, so we need to think about antidepressants. And da -da -da. So it's sort of gone from like, oh, my goodness, this is great, to actually, what are they doing to women? This is absolutely awful. So I think... Um, what we can do is just keep using our voices, actually, and I think that's making the biggest difference. I mean, they hate the word Davina because they think it's the Davina effect. What they don't know is that Kate Muir, who produced and wrote it, and me, have been the sickest thieves behind all this. But, you know, actually, isn't it good? It must have been like this in the 60s when women were asking for contraception. Um, but, you know, actually, you know, women we see and help are not going with all the symptoms, but going forwards, they're not going to go with their osteoporosis and their heart attacks and everything else as well. You know, women in care homes and residential homes are not the women who take HRT. So they, they need some growing up thinking. What they're doing, though, especially with the government, is they're looking at short-term costs and they're thinking, oh, my God, 14 million women, £4 a month, now we're giving it free. No, 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 we can't do that. And it's, it's just mind games, unfortunately. So, yeah not easy. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a good no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good. Question. With the dosing, 
every, everybody is different, and the way we absorb is very different. So what if I put a patch on and you put the same dose on, it'd probably be a different amount in your bloodstream because it depends on what your, the skin thickness is, what your circulation in your skin is like, whether your skin's warm or whether it's cold, all sorts of things. And so some of it is, um, I shouldn't really say this as a doctor, a bit hocus-pocus because, because we're different. Um, and if you start HRT in the perimenopause, you saw hormones are like this. So some days you'll need more hormones than others. So sometimes it's like chasing a moving target, really. Um, often people do need slightly more if they're getting symptoms. So it's still doing symptoms despite being on HR, the symptom checker despite being on HRT is important. Um, Sometimes we increase the dose, um, and then people say, oh gosh, I feel so much better. Then the proof is there. We sometimes do blood tests, which I know are harder in the NHS to do. Um, they can be useful, but they're not everything, because the patient is everything, not a number of a blood test. If the blood test of the oestrogen is low, then it shows that they're not absorbing it properly, and then it's, you can increase. Um, if it's normal or high, it still doesn't mean that the dose doesn't need changing. It's just at the time, because you only do the blood test, and it's at that time what your hormones were doing, not other times of the day or night. Um, so sometimes women will try changing the dose themselves. You can't overdose on your own hormone. It's very safe. Um, most times we try and keep levels of oestrogen between 250 and 1,000, which is what physiological doses are. Women who are pregnant have doses up to around 17,000, just to put things into perspective. Women who are pregnant often feel absolutely great because they've got all these hormones in their body. Um, so, um, yeah, so sometimes people find doses need changing with time. The HRT shortage, it's, I feel a bit responsible for it, and I'm sorry, but um, um, the, there is um, Everell patches, which are made by a company called Theramex. There's no shortage of those, and I don't think there will be because they've really got their act together. So the pharmacist can change, even if it's temporarily. Utrogestan has been a problem, but I'm being told that it should come in in early March, which is only a couple of weeks. So having a couple of weeks without progesterone is not going to do any harm for anyone. Um, then there's no reason why you need to stop HRT. They used to say stop it after five years or ten years because they were so worried about the breast cancer risk. Well, we know that the breast cancer risk isn't there with most types of HRT, um, and if it is there with older types, it's not statistically significant. So then we look at the benefits rather than the risks, and outweigh what, if one outweighs the other, then it's fine to continue. Everyone on HRT should be reviewed every year. Look at is it still beneficial to take HRT? For the vast majority of people, the answer is going to be yes. So you don't need to stop it. Because as soon as you stop it, you're going to get increased bone turnover, you're going to get more inflammation in the body. Your symptoms might or might not come back. That really varies. They, the studies show the average length of symptoms is seven years. But we see women who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s in the clinic who will say, well, I don't really have any symptoms. You say, well, what's the sleep like? Oh, no, it's dreadful. Do you get any muscle or joint pains? Yeah, it's awful. Do I? You know, what about your memory? Oh, no, no. And what about, do you have any leakage of your... Oh, yeah, but I'm just getting old now. And then you give them hormones, and then they're like, wow, gosh, I sleep well. Did. So, you know, symptoms can change with time. But, yeah, you, no one needs to stop HRT once they've started it. Thank you. At the back, yes. No, you can, yeah, I mean, you can carry on. The, no one's done any studies or any of this at all, so all I'm talking about is sort of clinical experience. But um, most people continue on the same dose. Um, they used to say lowest dose, shortest length of time, and actually if you look at the MHRA, um, the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority, it will still say lowest dose, shortest length of time. If you look at all the evidence and all the guidelines, they'll say you individualise dose, you have it for as long as the benefits outweigh the risks. And it's important to have enough because if you don't have enough, there's a risk of symptoms. But also, if you've got low oestrogen, you've got this pro-inflammatory state going on, so it still increases your risk of disease. Um, so there's no need to have the lower dose. If someone's had breast cancer, we'll often try and sort of, just because it feels about right, to try and reduce the dose, if, you know, to have the minimum dose that's available. Um, if we're starting HRT for older women, we had someone um, a year or so ago who came for her 90th birthday. She treated herself to an appointment. Um, <laughs> And we start older people often on a lower dose, partly because they've had a long time without hormones. 
um, but they quite quickly increase it usually. Um, so because the oestrogen through the skin is so safe without a risk of clot or stroke, it means that we can be, um, adjust the dose probably a lot quicker than if it was the tablets, and tablet oestrogen does have a small risk of clot. So um, I personally would be too scared to reduce my dose because I'm so scared of getting migraines and feeling awful again. I might get away with slightly less as I get older, but it doesn't really, it's a bit like reducing insulin or thyroxin, you know, if it, if it hasn't broken, then, you know, don't try and fix it really. So, yeah, a lot of people just carry on the same. Thank you. Now, though we're going over time a bit, I think we've got so many questions, we'll carry on just for a few minutes. Yes. Yeah, well, the, uh, we're laughing because Rebecca here did a video of rubbing it in, and then the next day there were lots of other people putting that you tap and you glide it, and then recently we saw something on our website, I won't say which one, where they were using the lid of the oestrogen gel and saying, don't put it on your hands, <laughs> use the lid. I was like, oh my goodness me. Or you can rub it, whatever, you can do whatever. It, all you're doing is getting it through into bloodstream. So, you know, you can put it on your forehead, you can put it on your foot, it doesn't actually matter. But you don't want to waste it. So the thought of it going elsewhere is really, you just rub it in like a moisturiser. Um, it doesn't actually matter. You know, some people will say that um, if it doesn't absorb very well, it's probably never going to. So I've spoken to some women see them in a review and we do a symptom questionnaire on every patient and their symptoms haven't improved and then you say to them well you've been using your gel they say oh yes but i lie i stand like this for three hours and it just floats off my skin it's like well <laughs> it's not going to work and then you give them a patch instead or there's a different make of gel and then three months after that they've sort of come back to life so you can't force it in if you see what i mean if, if it rubs in then fine but yeah most of us don't have loads of time in the morning, so the quicker you can rub it in, the quicker you can put your clothes on and carry on with your day, really. That's really useful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it really saddens me. You know, 10 years ago, I didn't know that women even produced testosterone. Seven years ago, when it came out in Nice Guidance, I started asking people about their libido, and they all told me that it was reduced, so I started prescribing it. Um, and I could see people waking up. And actually, in my general practice, when I was a GP, it was blacklisted, so I couldn't do it. But I just did it anyway, because I thought, well, I'm not going to be struck off by prescribing something that's under nice guidance. Um, and I got away with it because I was a menopause specialist. But oh, it's just, it's the safest thing I've ever prescribed. Um, and then we, we carried on prescribing it to women who have reduced libido out of guidance. And um, Dan's been looking at some of our data, and we do find that you know, mental health improvements improve um, you know, energy, concentration, sleep. You know, it is a really important hormone. Um, I've, I'm a fellow of the Royal College of GPs, and I had a meeting with them a few months ago because there's a lot of pushback about testosterone. And um, they said, oh, no, we, we're not encouraging our GPs to prescribe it. We want them to be referred to gynaecologists. And i am not been read about gynaecologists, but I don't know why they know more about testosterone than me. I can read the same papers. Patients can read the same papers. It's like we can decide. Um, and the waiting list for gynaecologists is really long, and most gynaecologists want to do surgery. They don't want to see menopausal women to give them testosterone. Um, and they said, no, we're not going to. So I did then email them back and say, well, you can't just cherry pick out of nice guidance. You do it all or you don't do it at all. Could you tell me the reasoning? And anyway, they, they, they haven't replied, and I don't think they will. And it really varies on CCGs, like you say. Um, GPs are allowed to prescribe. They're independent prescribers, so they are allowed to. No one's forbidding them to do it. Um, you can still prescribe as a GP if it's you know, with the right intention and you're, you're um, doing it with a patient's consent. So 
but GPs are scared and it's really difficult actually. Um, they, a lot of people will go privately. So we see people, um, we, we do a consultation just for testosterone actually, to, so we made it cheaper. Um, and sometimes once it's started and people are feeling better, then it's easier to carry on with it, even in the NHS. So that's one way of sort of getting around it. But it, it shouldn't be so hard to get our own hormones back. You know, it's a lot easier to get antidepressants. If I was a heroin addict, which I'm not, it would be a lot easier to get methadone. It's, it doesn't quite seem right. Um, there's more evidence that it is safe. There's been a lot of articles. There was one I was quoted in today in iNews. There was one in the Mail on Sunday, and, and some people are saying it's the same as placebo. Well, actually, it probably isn't. We're not that silly that we would just spend money on a placebo. We know how important it is in our brains and our body. So um, I think we just keep trying and maybe see someone else as well. Um, so I think it will change. Testosterone, the androfen we often prescribe is um, from Australia, and it's licensed for women in Australia and they're going through the MHRA process for it to be licensed. It used to be licensed as a patch and then they withdrew the license because the manufacturer stopped making them. Um, so I've been told it should be in the next six to 12 months it's licensed. If it's licensed, it might make it easier, but I just don't know. Thank Sorry. you. It wasn't very helpful, was it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a great question. So contraception, the guidelines say that women should have contraception um, until 55 if they're not sure about their periods or not, because after 55, there's always a case or two where people have got pregnant, but it's very unusual. Um, if people are on the contraceptive, if they have on the combined oral contraceptive and they have three weeks on and a week off, often in that week off they start to not feel as good because they haven't got hormones. Um, but any type of contraception, you can still... It, it, find that your sort of symptoms start to creep in. So doing a symptom questionnaire, like on the one on Balance app, every three months can be really useful. And then see yourself if you're getting any symptoms. If people are on a contraceptive, if they're on the combined contraceptive, sometimes we'll, if they don't need contraception, um, stop it and then add, do HRT instead because HRT is not contraceptive. Or sometimes we'll add in a bit of HRT with the contraceptive and see. If people are on the progesterone-only pill or a marina coil, then we can use HRT as well at the same time if they need contraception too. Um, but that's what makes it really difficult because there's no proper diagnostic test. Um, even periods, you know, you could be perimenopausal for 10 years before your periods stop. You don't want to wait for your periods to stop until you start to feel better, if you see what I mean. Sorry, it's a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Um, so often, you know, we often say in the clinic, we'll just try some hormones because we know they're really safe and then you'll soon know whether it's helping or not. Do you see what I mean? Thank you. Right, one more question mm, from this side. Uh, thank you. And I'm sorry for the yawn. My daughter is just five minutes. Oh. <laughs> well, um, you're here with lots of menopausal women, so we're used to yawning. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what the guidelines say. So it's not just me saying that. That's what the, the International Menopause Society guidelines say because there are more benefits than risks for most people. Um, so there's no reason to stop taking it. Um, no, and I think if GPs are saying that, then you should challenge them and say, why? Why are you asking me to stop? What are you worried about? What are the risks that you're worried about? They talk about breast cancer. Then, and the problem is even all the inserts will say breast cancer. The risk of breast cancer, if it is there, is very low, but the benefits are still there. And you can say, well, actually, I want to take it for my bones and my heart. And we know that it will reduce the risk of heart disease and osteoporosis. And as a consenting adult, I want to make a choice about my future treatment and then see what they say. <laughs> well, honestly, we could sit here 
uh, all night, and, <laughs> and it would still be interesting. <laughs> And, and we're so, so lucky to have heard from you tonight. We're so lucky that you are a visiting fellow um, at the college and you now get a, a lovely meal um, <laughs> as a reward. Thank you. And uh, there'll be all sorts of health risks at it. <laughs> um, wine, eating too much generally. Um, but I hope that um, you will enjoy it because it will be an expression of our gratitude. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much, Sue. Thank you. Thank you.